Welcome to an extra special, extra late MMA vivisection. This is Zane Simon, bloodyelbow.com, joined by Victor Rodriguez. This week, an unusual event for a UFC card, but uh, needs must on a holiday week, and we, uh, we're we running way behind schedule, and Vic has kindly offered to step in when I was about ready to cancel this thing, so I am glad to have him here. We're going to be talking about this Completely underwhelming UFC fight card. I got to say, and you know, I don't want to hate on this because I know that there's a lot of hardcore fans out there who are immediately going to be like, nah, it's always the bad card to the good one, man. You can't ever judge a book by its cover. Co- or by its cover. I almost want to say covered. I don't know why. Whatever. Um, but this, in a run of really underwhelming, meaningless fight cards, this one stands out as a really underwhelming, meaningless fight card. Like, the two UFC cards, the doubleheader last week, each of those had more fights on it that I was excited about than this. And the tough finale coming up, UFC Albany coming up, like, all that has more on it that I'm interested in than this card, which I gotta say is just kind of there. Well, I mean, I, I see that and I understand it, but um, I don't know if I agree with it due to the fact that, yeah, this is a card that's more catered to the local market and all that, but you do have some pretty interesting names, and it does seem like another one of those cards that it, it stylistically is tailored mostly to deliver action fights. You know, you got Shohi Ham and Daniel Taylor, uh, Damien Brown, John that? Talk. You know, these aren't names that stand out like, oh, my God, these are the mega stars of the future. Like, no, nah, but, I mean, they could be some fun. And probably but you saw Daniel Taylor's last UFC fight, right? Unfortunately, yeah. I mean, I saw some of her fights on the regionals, too, though. So, I mean. Yeah, yeah. I'm just saying we can't depend on. I, no. I am not depending on this for action. If it del- if it over delivers, awesome. Right. But if people skip it en masse. That's fine. I would never find somebody and be like, dude, you've got to see this UFC card this, this week, at, you know, this Saturday. I know you're going to spend time with your family, but fuck them. Go watch this this event. Like, this would never be that conversation. Yeah, and that's that's the other thing about this card is that you have, obviously, an, a major American holiday weekend. So the UFC decides in order to fulfill their TV commitments and get some gate revenue, they'll put the show on overseas, fulfill some of the contracts for the fighters. They'll put all this out. So it's, it's a net win for them, but it did suffer massively from the loss of the main event, which was supposed to be Rockhold versus Jacare, you know, a couple other things that maybe didn't go out the way they planned. So this is just sort of what we have. And, you know, it's, and I know we have that whole thing. I mean, we, we were unfortunately spoiled by a string of maybe four or five events a few years ago that looked terrible on paper and delivered on amazing action. And I think ever since we've got, well, I don't know. I mean, it looks bad, but it might be like, no, we, we need to disabuse ourselves of that notion forever. Like, that's not a guarantee. You can't use that as your, as your crutch for every event that looks bad on paper because sometimes it is going to be bad on paper. And this doesn't look like it's going to be bad to me, but it looks more promising than maybe, I don't know. I mean, I'm, I'm a little more excited for this one than I was for the Belfast card, for example. But, I mean, that's just me. I don't know. It, it seems like it'll be okay. It won't yeah. be. Good, but but I mean, the, the Belfast card for me, like, you even had, you know, you had, like, Alexander Volkov was going to be on that thing. And we got yeah. Artem Labov and Taruto Ishihara. It's like a weird fight. And. I, I like Magnus Sidenblad and Kyoji Horiguchi and Magomed Mustafaev. Like, there were a bunch of random dudes on that card that I was interested in. This card, like, you know, I'm kind of interested in Volkanovsky and in Pedro and some of these dudes, but I, I, there's just not even that, like, those, like, fun kind of culty UFC fighters who secretly put on awesome fights and show up all the time. There are like a couple of those, you know, there's like Jake Matthews and Chris Camozzi, but there's just not a lot of stuff on this that I am. Yeah, no, I, I agree that there is considerably less meat on this bone, but I'm, I don't know. Maybe I'm just not as down on it as you are. You're I being very positive and that's great. That's why you're here. But let's. I shouldn't be, but I am. But before we get too far into that and way off track, let's just jump right into this uh, and get to the first fight. Yao Kui versus Janelle Lausa. Yeah, about it? there's going to be a strange one here. Um, Yao Jiqui, I get the inclination that he's one of those Chinese fighters that came in 
and had the excuse or the uh, or you know it's it's been said and rumored that he had a bunch of fights on the Chinese circuit that were wins that were never on his official record or whatever. I, that's the only excuse I can think of for a guy who's two and three coming into the UFC, and also the fact that even though flyweight is pretty much a very thin division, um, and let's not let's not say thin because that that would be a knock on talent in a way, but let's say it's a smaller division. They're not shy on cutting guys who don't have good records. So I don't know, man. I don't know how exactly this happened, but well, he came in off tough, and t- they just needed anyone who had even looked at an MMA gym before. Remember, they brought on a yoga instructor because he thought yeah. MMA was cool. Like, yeah, and w- once he found out he had to fight the people that were training with him, he was like, oh, no, we're not doing this. I don't yeah. think I ever saw that guy throw a punch, but whatever. Look, he's two and one. Uh, well, I'm sorry, one and two in the UFC. Uh, his only win was a um, against Nolan Tickman in the um, uh, event uh, where Frankie Edgar fought Uri Faber in the Philippines back in uh, 2015. Not really that much on this. Uh, Lausa is actually one of those – I mean, he's a, he's a Filipino talent who's been tearing it up in PXC. He's coming in off a four-win streak, and he's been, you know, two of those wins have been one of them a knockout, the other one a submission. I definitely would have to say 100% go with Laos on this one. There's no way I would go with, with Zhao. It just, it's just not going to make any sense. Wait, so you're picking? I'm picking Laos. Oh, uh, yeah. All right. Yeah, that I, I, I feel pretty much the same on that. Um, Jiqui, to me, strikes me as a guy who has a – Who's depended, especially, I don't, you know, and he didn't fight much regionally to, that I can tell even. I don't even think he had that padded regional re- or that regional record that, you know, a few of those guys came in with that was underreported. Mythical Chinese records. You well, know, I mean, yeah, some of those guys did. Some of those guys have had like 20 smokers or whatever. But he strikes me as a guy who's really like, he's focused on being a wrestler in MMA and his wrestling's not that great. He's not that imposing a physical figure. You know, he, he got in there with Freddie Serrano and in a wrestler versus wrestler battle against a, a uh, Olympic caliber wrestler, even for a, a, a country that doesn't have a lot of great wrestling uh, in Colombia. You know, Serrano had, was just way, way too much for him. Yeah, quickly. Serrano's game is a bit underrated because even for a company, for a country as you mentioned like Colombia that doesn't have like a major wrestling culture, he is like internationally he's you know he's done pretty well for himself. And trying to wrestle against a guy like that, I mean, yeah, yeah. And Lausa is not a great wrestler; it's not terrible, but he's a really good athlete. He's got a lot of high level, reasonably high level competition out of PXC, which does actually a pretty good job of matching guys up and getting guys tough fights. And his, he's a decent boxer. He knows how to stay in the pocket. He throws with power. He's consistent. He's a good athlete. Unless Jiqui can just absolutely hold him down and grind him, I think Lausa should win. Uh, odds on this fight, Lausa is a favorite, minus 122 to minus 130, or 145. Uh, Jiqui, the... Underdog plus one fifteen to plus one oh five, which that feels about right for me. I mean, Laos is missing the one part of, the, of his game he's missing is the one part that Jiqui has, and so there's always a chance that you know you, you don't want to get too invested in two guys coming out of limited regional scenes facing each other. Uh, and that brings us to a bantamweight bout: Marlon Vera versus Ning Guangyu, mm. and or Guangyu Ning, I suppose. I'm not sure which. I, I'm never uh, sure whether when those names get reversed and when they don't. But it depends on who you're speaking to. For American terms, Guangyu Ning is is yeah. good enough. Guangyu Ning, but uh, I and I'm seeing this. This is kind of a lot. This is a lot like the fight that. Ning just lost to Marco Beltran, except with the worst version of Marco Beltran. Like, Marlon Vera is a very, very kick-heavy fighter from outside. Uh, really tries to... And can get backed up pretty easily. And then is, you know, very willing to grapple off his back and dive on low-chance subs and take risks that don't work out for him. But... Guang Yuning is just not a um, 
very well-rounded fighter. Like he is, he he has some power. He's learned how to box a bit, but he really only throws one or two big strikes at a time. Especially if he's got an opponent that's trying to stay outside of him and stay away. He doesn't have very good footwork to cut off, so he'll throw some random flurries and doesn't close distance that well. But I'm and so I don't know. This is a weird fight because Vera is you know. Guang Yuning also barely lost that fight to Marco Beltran. And I think that Vera is going to play a lot of the same game. Vera is going to do a lot of backing up, and backing up with a kick heavy game is not a great idea. But it's just a question of can uh, Guang Yu actually close him down? Or can Ning close him down often enough to land enough offense to take rounds? I think I'm actually going to lean Ning here. I just, I'm not a big fan of Vera's game at all, but if Vera, I mean, if Vera can land a lot of kicks, if he can get a sub off his back, he's going to be more, he's probably going to be more effectively aggressive in moments than Ning. I just think he's going to end up on the back foot a lot. So I'm picking Guang Yu Ning, but not by much. Yeah, what's interesting to me about this fight is that Vera is really more than anything a jiu-jitsu guy. And Ning, despite his faults in the stand-up department, he's actually not, you know, he's, he's pretty sharp with, with a lot of his shot selection on the ground when it comes to actually getting to the ground and, and uh, striking an opponent from there, trying to, you know, find better positions and just stay busy, stay active. And I think that's going to benefit him greatly because I don't know if Vera is really going to be able to submit him. Um, it's mostly been his game and, it, you know, you look at some of his fights from the Latin American circuit, what got him into the UFC. And I don't know, man, I just think his limitations have been, they were largely on display in his last fight as well. And it just, it doesn't seem to me like this will go well for him. So I got to go with, uh, with, with uh, Ning on this one. Yeah, and uh, Ning is the favorite, minus 112 to minus 150. Marlon Vera, the underdog, plus 120, down to plus or down to minus 108. Uh, I don't really see any problem in those lines or any reason to bet them. Honestly, these fights, these first two fights are, you know, guys from very limited circuits with very limited games, major problems. The lines are more or less adjusted right that I can see. And if you're, you know, picking either of these guys, they can both win or lose at any moment for yeah, any number but, of reasons. But you got to bet on the guy that beat Royston Wee. Royston Wee. <laughs> you you Royston do not Wee. have to bet on the guy that beat Royston Wee. Oh, okay. All right. That brings us to a featherweight bout. Dan Hooker versus Jason Knight. Ooh. Yeah, that's an interesting one because Jason Knight – I'm sorry, it is my turn, right? Yeah, um, yeah. Go okay. ahead. <laughs> I was like, oh, God, I steamrolled this shit again. Um, Jason Knight, you know, uh, very much, um, you know, he's, he's got that wrestling and he's got that sort of, you know, the, the archetypical wrestle boxer style. Uh, taking on a guy in Dan Hooker who's got, I mean, his, his style is a little stranger, I guess. Um, I don't know. It, it's, it seems to me like Hooker is working out. He's shown improvement in some of his fights from here on for, that, that he's had since um, joining the UFC, even though he's been alternating wins and losses. But the losses that he's had have usually been to much more dynamic athletes like Yair Rodriguez and Maximo Blanco. So I'm not really sure how that's going to uh, work against him because neither one of those guys – well, no, Maximo is uh, certainly a far better wrestler. I don't know if Jason Knight's going to be able to capitalize based on his wrestling alone. Uh, I think that maybe his use of range may not be as efficient. I think maybe his use of angles might not be as good. I mean, he, I've kind of seen him, and I hope I'm remembering this correctly, sort of being one of those guys who backs up in a straight line if there's too many punches coming at him at once. Um, so I think that sort of thing might be what ends up costing him here, and I'm going to have to go with Hooker on it. This is a weird fight for me because, I mean, you got two guys, honestly, I think – in this case, neither of them is really a very good wrestler at all. Uh, Knight, they're both guard grapplers. And Hooker tends to be a entirely... His, off, his striking offense on the feet is really almost exclusively at its best in the clinch. But he's not... He hasn't been strong enough to keep a fight there. Guys like... I mean, 
Hatsu Hiyoki for that fight, like Hatsu Hiyoki was dialing Hooker up on the feet before Hooker landed that head kick that ended it. And the, his big problem with Maximo Blanco was that every time he'd get inside to try and work his offense on Blanco, Blanco would just push him out and push him back to the outside where Hooker's a little clunkier. He's more creative standing than Jason Knight, but Knight really, um, maybe even to the point of being misplaced, he has a ton of confidence in his ability to strike in the pocket. He will just wade in and throw a ton of offense, a lot of punches, throws good snapping short punches in combination, but he'll just square up right in front of somebody and, you know, try to take one to land two. And I actually think that'll serve him pretty decently against Hooker. Um, Hooker's more creative. Hooker could catch him out with something. Both guys are really scrappy grapplers. Um, And I'm not sure. If this fight became a grappling battle, that'd probably be the most fun. But I see Knight just waiting inside and outworking Hooker in the pocket. And then being able to push Hooker off when Hooker tries to get his clinch game going. So... I'm going to pick Knight here to take a scrappy decision, a lot like the one he took over Jim Ehlers, except against a less powerful puncher. So that that's my pick here. The odds on this fight, Dan Hooker is the favorite, minus 160 to minus 180, and Jason Knight, the underdog, plus 148 to plus 125. <sighs> I don't know that there's any betting on those lines, honestly. I think that Knight is a... I think Knight can win, um, but at under under plus 200, I don't know that there's actually a lot of value in that. And both guys are scrappy finishers. Both guys have submission ability. Uh, Knight's, you know, Knight has less of the creativity to finish with strikes. But I just... I think they're both, you know, I think Knight's pretty tough too. So I just don't see a lot of picks to make there. Um, And that brings us to the end of, that's the last fight pass bout. That's the fight pass headliner. We're going on to Fox Sports 1 now and a flyweight bout. Ben Wen against John Herrera. And uh, this is going to be a crazy fight. This is actually a fight I'm looking forward to. Because it is a battle of two guys who are more athletic than they are technically polished. And, that um, you know, Nguyen's been at this a long time. Long enough that, despite it never seeming like he really has had a really perfectly put together technical camp to form a great technical game, he's got enough uh, time in the cage at this point that he's got a lot of polish and like veteran savvy he's got great timing on his counters he's got you know he's got a lot of great scrambling ability he knows how to throw submissions up he knows how to defend he knows how to do a lot of little things even though like he's never seemed to have a very great consistent wrestling game his grappling game isn't as deep as it is athletic and aggressive and his striking is not as defensively well-tuned as it could be he still does, you know, he, he does a, a lot. He's a lot of fun to watch, and he's got a lot of savvy to him. And John Herrera is just a young kid who's been thrown in way into the deep end because of his standout athletic ability. He's a great athlete who's also he's working out of a really tiny camp in Florida, and he's got, you know, power in his hands. He's an athletic grappler. He's also kind of missing that wrestling game and his grappling game is very non-traditional, very funky. He goes for these weird subs and crazy scrambles. I'm picking Ben Wen to actually just be busier. I think John Herrera is still missing the volume in his striking and Nguyen has found, knows how to pressure. He knows how to apply himself. My big worry, I think, for Nguyen is that if he can't put John Herrera away early, he might get tired and then John Herrera could take over and maybe submit him in a crazy scramble later. Or John Herrera's funky grappling could just throw and win for a loop and uh, get him a win. But I think wins the, I would pick, I'm picking him to be able to ride out and stay safe for a decision and be busy enough to take rounds. So take a pen win there. 
Yeah, I'm, I'm going to have to disagree with you on this one because I think that Herrera's wrestling is definitely going to make a difference in this. I don't have enough faith in Nguyen staying upright for that long. I, I for some at some point Herrera's insistence and, and just you know being just doggedly pursuing that takedown. Eventually, he's going to have to land one, and once he gets there, it's going to test not only Nguyen's cardio, but what he can really do off his back. And I'm not really sure if. I'm not really sure if he's going to be able to do enough from there to actually, uh, you know, finish the fight or, you know, keep things from going uh, horribly bad for him and actually, you know, turning things around. Now, whether that means posting and getting up or using the cage to get up, I, I don't really think that that's going to happen. I think once he goes down, he's going to stay down. It's all a matter of when that happens and not if. Um, now, it probably may not happen in the first round, but I think that uh, Rara could definitely tire him out and start working from there. So, I'm going to go with him on this one. You know, with John Herrera, I'm just not sure that Herrera has the wrestling to keep Wynn down. You know, like, Wynn was pretty damn competitive with Louis Smolka in the first round of their fight. He put Smolka in some serious trouble, had his back, just then started to fade. But it'll be interesting because, you know, John Herrera is a great athlete. He's a better athlete than Louis Smolka. He's just not as uh, technically consistent. He's kind of got this really funky, funky game. Yeah, he seems to muscle a lot of his stuff, but it, it's yeah. been working out for him so far, so, you know. Well, until he fought Ali Bagatinov. Well, yeah, but that's understandable. Yeah. Uh, Herrera is, in fact, the favorite here. Minus 114 to minus 145. Win the underdog, plus 115 to plus 100. I honestly think that win might be worth a tiny, tiny bet here. Just because Herrera really has yet to prove that he's technically ready f- to fight at this level. You know, even Joby Sanchez was beating him to the punch for a lot of that fight before Herrera came back and knocked him out. And otherwise, uh, Herrera has lost to Borg and Bagatinov. And I there's just nothing that, th- there's no surety that Herrera is ready to win tough fights in the UFC. He's a good athlete, but his game is really underdeveloped. So I think at an, as an underdog, I, I think Nguyen might be worth a little something there. And I, I don't trust Herrera's coaching either. That's the other thing. I don't trust him to make big strides with the camps he's at. So that brings us to Richard Wal- or Rich Walsh, Filthy Rich, versus Jonathan Munier. And or Mounier, I suppose, because it's French Canada. Uh, and I believe this is you. What do you got on this? I'm going to have to go with Richie Walsh on this one. Um, he's got a funky, awkward style, but he's also got a really decent clinch game. He's He seems to be probably stronger here in this one. Um, not necessarily the most dynamic athlete, but certainly does have a fair degree of durability to him. Take a bunch of hits. He's not clueless on the ground. He's actually, um, you know, he trains with a pretty good crew of jiu-jitsu guys. And, I mean, it probably hasn't shown as much in his fights because a lot of his uh, UFC performances have mostly been um, striking exchanges uh, for the majority of them. So, I don't know, man. I, I don't think I've seen enough out of, uh, out of Munir for me to say that he's really um, – how do I put this? I, I – I don't really have that much faith in him being able. This is this is kind of the, the sort of opponent that would really give him a lot of fits. Now, granted, he's not going to be dealing with like a heavy pressure wrestler or submission artist or anything like that. He's not going to be dealing with a guy who's the most technical striker or anything like that. But it's kind of like one of those Tim Bosch type things. Like you can kind of expect a, a fair degree of chaos and that old man contractor strength that'll just, you know, really change the tide of a fight with one or two hits. Um, so, you know, I, I just – I kind of think that that, along with some fits of accuracy that Walsh is able to hit, again, that funky style, it catches guys off guard. You know, it just bobs a little bit, weaves for a second, and then just lands those shots that you might not have been expecting. So I'm going to have to go with Walsh. Uh, I, I, you know what? You're continuing the uh, – Connor's not here, but that is a very Connor-spirited pick. And you're continuing the, the long-running standard of – my co-hosts picking Rich Walsh and then being, I think, terribly disappointed 
which I love Rich Walsh. I think he's a really fun fighter. He just has about the most limited game that you can have in the UFC, and he's incredibly foot slow. This is a guy that got outpaced by Kichi Kunamoto. You know, like, just could not catch up. I thought he won that fight, but he could not catch up with Kunimoto to save his life, and that's why he lost it. Yeah, he's he's like a better Kahal Pendred. Yeah, well, kind of, except Kathal Pendred won more fights in the UFC. Oh, than... come on. He didn't earn them. Come on. <laughs> Not all of them. <laughs> Still, Walsh. No, every... no, you, I see your point. You're right. Every time, like, Walsh's wins have come against the smallest, least athletic fighters he's faced. And Munier is just not that guy. Munier is a very wooden, clunky striker, but he's huge. And he is a good pressure wrestler if he's a better wrestler than you. And I think in this case, he's got that on Walsh. Walsh, his wrestling game has just never clicked. And even when he can, like, stuff a shot or compete on the ground, he's not dangerous there. And it seems to make him really tired. And I just, I think that Munier is going to be able to stay out way outside and keep Walsh off of him and then hit takedowns and outwork him on the ground. And Walsh is just, his game is just not work. It, it, you know, being a good fighter in dirty boxing range only is just not enough. And that's kind of who Rich Walsh is. It's especially not enough at welterweight. It can get you by it, like middle, light, heavyweight, and heavyweight, but... Down at welterweight, guys tend to have a bit too much to offer. Munier is the favorite. Munier is the favorite here, minus one twenty-five to minus one forty-five. Walsh, the underdog, plus one twenty-three to plus one hundred five. Think that's reasonable. I would even argue that Walsh should be a bigger underdog than that, um, just because. Like I say, I, I, he's somebody I think a lot of people keep waiting for him to win big fights and look better in fights, and he has not to date. Like, he just... Even Steve Kennedy, that fight was super hard on Rich Walsh. He made that fight impossibly difficult on himself. Um, So, I just don't see it. And that was a great matchup for Walsh. That was, like, the perfect matchup for Walsh, and he made it as hard on himself as he could have. Um, that brings us to Damian Brown versus John Tuck. Um, I got to go with Tuck here, 100%. I know he got out, out blitzed and, you know, he basically got outworked by a more technical boxer than Josh Emmett. I think Emmett threw him for a loop with his speed and power and straight punching ability. Um, uh, Tuck really came into that fight only throwing power hooks and trying to brawl Emmett inside, whereas Emmett worked this really nice in and out, uh, sharp striking games, quick straight punches, get back out of range, and Tuck just trying to march forward and brawl, never found his feet. Brown doesn't have the speed to do that. Brown has some sneaky power in his hands. He hits hard, but he's not, he has a habit of, Trying to, t- trying to wrestle guys and scramble with guys and grapple guys and then getting outworked in those scrambles and in those wrestling exchanges by people who are faster than him and more athletic than him. And I think that uh, that's what's going to happen here. He'll trade a bit with Tuck on the feet maybe, and then maybe Brown will shoot for a takedown and then find himself mounted or you know, find Tuck scrambling to his back really quickly. And I, I, I got John Tuck here, um, maybe even potentially by submission. I'm going to have to agree with that. I mean, largely, not only uh, Tuck's athleticism, but just how much far ahead he is in in terms of his striking and not just the strikes that he throws, but how he sets up his shots. You know, he's got a better use of angles. He's got, you know, craftier boxing. You know, he's able to slip some shots and work his way in. Whereas Brown, I mean, Brown's good, but I just kind of feel like this is one of those fights where he's going to be a step behind in each of these exchanges. And it's just not going to go well for him. Even if he doesn't get finished, it's one of those things. We're just going to be made to look, you know, like a far lesser striker than perhaps he is because of the fact that Tuck is so good at those small things that end up making uh, a really good fighter. And that's kind of where it's going to be. All right. Uh, Tuck is the favorite here, minus 137 to minus 150. Brown, the fav- the underdog, 
plus 128 to plus 115. And this is a fight I really feel like Tuck is worth a small bet at, the, at, at favorite odds at minus 137. I would be I, I would be slightly surprised if Brown pulled out an upset here. Um, I just don't see the uh, athleticism in his game to hang at this level. You know, even like even regionally, this is somebody who would get into scrambles and get outworked, who lost a lot of fights regionally because faster guy. In the UFC, you know, he's got a KO win over Cesar Arzamendia, which shows, like I say, he does have a little more power than he uh, than you would expect out of him. But Arzamendia has also been knocked out by Marco Polo Reyes, and like it's just not the biggest measure. Win- winning against a uh, tough Latin America season two guy is not a great high bar to predict future UFC success. So. A season two guy that is largely a chinny kickboxer. Yeah. Yeah. It's just, it's, I, I got to think that Tuck should be a bigger favorite here, even coming off a loss to Emmett, where Emmett presented problems that Brown just absolutely cannot. That brings us to a middleweight bout, the people's main event, as it were, Dan Kelly versus Chris Camozzi. Take it away, man. Um, I like Chris Camozzi. I, I, I think he's. I think he's all right. I just. Um, I don't really know if. Okay, realistically, he should win this fight. You know, based on prior opposition, based on a certain set of skills that he brings in. You know, his Muay Thai, when he's sharp and organized with his striking, can be really, really great to watch. But the problem is that he just gets loose, and then from there on, it's crazy wing and hooks, and it's diving after shots that he probably shouldn't be taking. I'm not really sure how that's going to work here. Um, it, it, Kelly is, by and large, obviously a judo specialist. I mean, shit, it's in his nickname. It might as well be part of his legal name at this point. But the thing is that I don't really – I think that sort of he's, he's found this – he's hit of something of a stride as of late, and it may not be the most dramatic improvement, but – I don't know, man. I'm going to go with the crazy upset here. I'm going to go fa- – Kamozi should on paper certainly be the favorite, but I'm going to go with Dan Kelly on this one because, number one, he hits hard. Number two, he hits hard, especially in close. I think that's kind of maybe where Kamozi's going to end up in some sort of brain fart situation. And maybe we get to see a little judo out of this. You know, I, I don't know. I don't know if Kamozi's wrestling is going to be enough to take down a guy who's known to stop takedowns from that hip strength, from, you know, being able to drop his weight and shift. Um, I think that at some point, going for a takedown, Kelly's just going to be able to capitalize and punish him with some sort of reversal, and then just start working from there. So, uh, you if think that's Kamozzi's the case, going for takedowns in this fight, Kamozi might. I mean, I don't know. Shit, we, this is the most random sport ever. He very well could, but he could. I, I don't think it'll. It certainly won't be Plan A. Yeah, you know, something has to go either really wrong, or he's got to see some sort of deficiency, something that he can. This- shut this fight, like, I, I'm I'm glad you're picking Kelly because it, this is a fight that I'm not picking Kelly because I can't. I can't bring myself to do it. But it's a fight that is ripe for Dan Kelly to win, even though Chris Camozzi is a much better fighter. And I want to make this clear. Chris Camozzi is a much better fighter than Dan Kelly. He's a much better athlete. He is... I, I, I mean, I understand Dan Kelly is a very good judoka and yeah. a, you know, absolute brick shit house of a man who is strong as hell. So maybe to say Chris Camozzi is a better athlete isn't correct. Chris Camozzi is a lot faster than Dan Kelly and a lot more coordinated. Well, we, we've been we've been over this particular yeah. thing before about athleticism yeah. being multidirectional. It can be yeah. you know, it can be measured by various ways. So perhaps it's more apt to say that Kamozi is the more well-rounded athlete, and he's more of a dynamic he, and explosive. He's guy. more he's a more dynamic athlete. Yeah. Kelly probably has better balance and is just stronger. Yeah, you know he's done things that require great balance and strength for his whole professional life. Yeah. Um, but Kamozi's faster. He's a more coordinated striker. He's a better striker. He's a more diverse striker. But Kelly is functional because he's so strong and because he's got such great balance. He can be 
taken down if you're more dynamic than him. If you've got a great dynamic entry like Antonio Carlos Jr. hit early in that fight, Kelly can be put on his ass pretty quickly. But as that fight went on and that dynamic entry went away, Kelly became damn near impossible to take down. But the interesting thing for me here is that Kamozi is probably going to want to win this fight in the clinch. And that's exactly where Kelly wants it and where Kelly is going to be at his best. And so Kamozi really has to give Kelly his best shot to win, to win. Kamozi outside from range is still kind of a very limited, like, pick pick away, little shots, just trying to keep points on the board and um, pressure and get his opportunity to get inside striker. He's not this amazingly dangerous whirlwind from outside. He wants to be inside where he can get the plum, land knees and elbows, control, and really assert his aggression that way. And that's going to be good for Kelly. That's going to be as good as it can be for Kelly. I just... I think that this is the point where Kelly's athletic disadvantages in that speed and in that in that coordination finally come to bear. Um, Luke Zakrich, Pat Walsh, Steve Montgomery, and you know Antonio Carlos Jr. They almost came to bear there, but Antonio Carlos Jr. just doesn't have the experience that Kamosi does. Doesn't have the ability to stay competitive, to stay in a fight mentally, and to fight hard in the all the all the way through that Kamozi does. And so I think that even if you know Kamozi walks himself into a couple big shots early or something like that, he's not going to go away. He's going to absolutely stay after Kelly for three rounds. And I think this is finally the point where Kelly's uh limitations as a stand-up fighter, his foot speed, his hand speed, his clunkiness and his hit ability all come into play. Um but, you know, like I say, Kamozi will probably walk right into the pocket to try to make that happen, which is going to give Kelly every opportunity to land hard shots, to hit judo trips, to get top position, and to make this fight as ugly as possible. So, so basically what you're saying is this whole thing was a long rationalization for you to express your desire to see Kamozi fight Jacare again. Is that what is that Yes, what? I do want to see Kamozi <laughs> step into Jacare, against Jacare one more time. Yes. Um. Odds here, Kamozi is the big favorite, minus 245 to minus 290. Kelly, the big underdog, plus 241 to plus 195. Uh, that, in fact, makes Chris Kamozi the second biggest favorite on this entire card, which I'm not feeling exactly. Like, I think Kamozi should absolutely win this fight. He has all the tools to win it. But um, Kelly's also kind of a slightly different animal than the guys he's fought and beat lately. You know, he's... Yeah, I'd agree with that. Maybe he's maybe not so dissimilar from Tom Watson, but he's a lot busier in what he's a lot i don't know like he's he he he's not dissimilar from watson but he's a little i don't know he's he's a little different this is it's he's it's definitely different than v, joe riggs or vitor miranda um and that that watson fight was kind of an ugly fight so i don't know it, it'll be interesting i'm expecting kamozi to win but Dan Kelly will get the fight Dan Kelly wants, I would say. So it's something to keep in mind with the odds being as wide as they are. I think Kamozi deserves to be the favorite, but um, there might, that's tough too, because both guys are ridiculously tough. Kamozi's never been knocked out. I don't know that Kelly has ever been knocked out either. Or, uh, let's see, is that right? Dan Kelly. Yeah. Uh, no, he was knocked out by Sam Alvey. And yeah. so, yeah, it's it, it's even a tough fight to maybe prop bet at that point with guys who are tough and durable. So that brings us to the main card on FS1. The opener of the main card, Sohi Ham versus Danielle Taylor. Um, This fight's a little like Ben Wen versus John Herrera to me where 
Taylor has a lot of power, a lot of great athleticism, but is an extremely raw fighter that I'm just not sure I trust to win at this level. Hom is, you know, she's not powerful. She is uh, not an overwhelming physical presence, but she is a good, patient, reasonably technical fighter who throws great counters and who knows how to work a good round winning game. She knows how to strike in volume. She knows how to hit takedowns when she needs to. She's not, you know, an amazing grappler or an amazing controlling force. But she knows how to fight to her strengths despite her physical limitations. And the interesting thing here is that she's not going to be fighting somebody who's way bigger than her for once. She's going to be fighting somebody who doesn't have a huge physical edge on her, although um, Taylor probably has an athletic edge. I'm going to pick Hom to outpoint Taylor, to outwork her. Um, in kind of the same way that she did against Courtney Casey, but against a smaller fighter. But if Taylor just abs is way too physical and can hurt Hom standing and can just bull through her, then, you know, Hom's going to have problems. Hom may just not have the physicality to play a points game in the UFC at straw weight. So... It's an interesting. It'll be an interesting measuring stick for that. But I'm picking Ham here. Yeah, I'm also going with Ham, and I think largely it's going to be dependent on her movement. You know, Taylor is very. Um, I mean, she hits really, really hard, but a lot of that is because of the fact that she sits down in a big way on a lot of those strikes, and uh, you know, it, it's going to be difficult to do that when you have someone who's so good at moving around. I mean, you look at that fight she had against uh, Joanne Collarwood, it's like, you know, she was able to fluster her opponent based on that. And this was a a rangy, very technical striker. Um, I mean, Taylor is, you know, her her boxing is okay, but that's really where her striking resides. She doesn't have that much of a kick game, and she's not very much of uh, someone who's able to follow up with different angles or cut off the cage or anything like that. Uh, So she's very limited in that aspect. So unless it turns into a dogfight inside – which I'm pretty sure Ham is going to try to avoid. I don't really see how that's going to work. So I, I really do see her outpointing Taylor on this. Um, and well, it's kind of the thing where unless Daniel Taylor knocks her out, Ham is going to win. Like that's your yeah. two options, basically. Yes, that's exactly it. It's a true, 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 true outcome fight where Taylor either hits her so hard that she knocks her out, or Taylor gets outworked over three rounds. Um, hopefully busier than the Marina Moreau's fight. So, uh, Hom is the underdog, or is the favorite there, minus 115 to minus 130. Taylor, the slight underdog, plus 109 down to minus 105. I think Hom deserves to be a little bigger of a favorite here, just because Fighters is raw. Like I say, with fighters like Taylor and Herrera, they are so raw and their games need so much uh, technical advancing and tech, you know, they need, they need, they have so far to go. It's really hard for me to look at fighters like that against anyone who has a, you know, has experience, who has fought at a high level, who has got wins at this level and say, oh, they should absolutely be able to compete and maybe beat this person. I, it's a very much a, a I have to see it to believe it situation for me. And so that's kind of where I am with Taylor. I, I think Hom should be a little bigger favorite. I still don't know that I would bet on Hom here because Taylor has so much hand speed and so much power. Um, and that's the thing, the big thing for her is that that makes that power transfer so well. Not only does she sit down, but she's got a lot of speed, so she can th- you know she can she can hit. Uh, women a lot faster than a lot of them are, are used to. A lot of them, you know, she's got better hand speed than a lot of women in that division, and they, they'll they throw out a couple punches not expecting anything to come back that fast and get cracked. So not saying bet on Hom at favorite odds, but I am saying that I think the odds are a little narrow there. And that brings us to a light heavyweight bout, Tyson Pedro versus Khalil Roundtree. Yeah, okay, well, the thing with Tyson Pedro is that he's been fighting guys, and this is where things get a little weird here with these two fighters, because they've both got a relative 
um, relatively same level of experience in their professional records, except that Roundtree has had the experience of being on the Ultimate Fighter and kind of showed a degree of growth in the brief period that he was there. I mean, he's he's a guy who just does not stop hitting you when you're on the ground. It's he's even if that means that maybe, you know, he will probably let you improve position slightly to defend yourself, he's still going to go after that. Um whereas Pedro, you know, I, I haven't seen him in the kind of trouble uh that a guy like Roundtree can get a fighter in. I don't know if that makes any sense. It's like he's he's the kind of pressure that he brings, I don't think he's really seen that before and that's certainly going to be tested. Certainly he has he stays busy when he's on his back. I mean, if he gets taken down, he's going to do his best to try to get up. And he's a very strong guy who's able to to, to maybe make that work, even though Roundtree certainly is a heavy um, fighter who's just really good at keeping that pressure on his opponent. Uh, I do worry about Roundtree's cardio. But then again, Pedro hasn't shown to have an exceptional degree of cardio either, although his boxing does look pretty sharp. Um Again, much like we were talking about Kamozi earlier, once he loosens up, though, it starts to get a little more random. So I don't know if I can trust him on that. So smart money says Roundtree. Yeah, I I got to kind of agree. I think the big thing here that I'm I'm looking at is will Tyson Pedro's offensive wrestling transfer? If it transfers to the UFC, if it transfers to a UFC level, then he can beat Roundtree because Roundtree, he's a more – I think Pedro is a more technical fighter than Roundtree uh, in general. His stand-up is more technical. His wrestling and his grappling are a bit more technical. But he hasn't had any of the experience that Roundtree has had of fighting at this level. Of, you know, Roundtree even just fighting Andrew Sanchez of getting in there in the UFC and knowing how to, you know, what it's like to be pushed and have somebody really, really challenge you on a big stage. And so if Pedro's wrestling game does not translate, because clearly Roundtree's got good first level takedown defense. He can stuff the, uh, uh, the first shot well. It's just that Andrew Sanchez, being a very good wrestler and grappler, was able to chain him up and drag him down and really tax his cardio that way. If Tyson Pedro gets stuffed on that first shot and can't chain it up, then he's going to be hanging out with somebody who's just as athletic as him, who's got just the same hand speed and punching power he does, and who's been on a big stage who is going to be working hard not to gas out, not to, you know, put himself in a bad situation. And Pedro may not have that experience. Pedro may, at that point, I think if he gets frustrated and can't link his grappling, get his grappling game, get his wrestling game going, I don't trust him to be able to uh, stay consistent in his striking. But that will be, I think, even if that happens, that could end. You could end up with like a coin flip fight where you've got two fast-handed, slick power punchers who are going to be trading shots, and the first guy to land a big one could knock the other one out. So, I'm leaning towards Khalil Roundtree here, but it's really going to come down to whether or not, to me, whether or not Pedro can get takedowns. If he can, I think Pedro's ground game is slicker he's uh danger more dangerous there he can tire roundtree out but if he can't then you've you're coming to a a firefight to see whose chin is tougher and who lands the big shots faster so tough fight should be a fun one leaning roundtree but only based on having been been at this level before and for having good enough first level takedown defense to stuff pedro's shots Odds have Roundtree as the slight favorite, minus 137 to minus uh, 160. And Pedro, the underdog, plus 130 down to plus 115. I don't see any problem with it there. Uh, I think that Roundtree should be the slight favorite. I might say, though, that, um, let's see, there's a prop bet. Um, let's see. Is there fight doesn't uh, fight doesn't go the distance is minus three twenty under one and a half rounds is minus one oh five 
that might be a small bet to make, a little chunk of change there. Um, to bet that it finishes quick, both guys throw hard. Neither guy has great cardio. Pedro has several ways to finish. That might be the way to go. Um, let's see. It, do they have Pedro by submission at plus 300? That might also be a small chance because that's how Pedro tends to get most of his wins. But I don't know. It's going to be a close... I expect a close, ugly fight between two scrappy light heavyweights that finishes pretty quickly. That brings us to a... I don't know. I, I think this is a lightweight bout. Wiki has it as a featherweight, but the UFC has it listed at lightweight. It'd be nice if it was featherweight. Both guys should drop. But a uh, lightweight bout, I believe, between Yusuke Kasuya and Alex Volkanovsky. And I I got to pick Volkanovsky pretty handily here. I think he's a massively undersized lightweight, but fortunately for him, he is fighting another undersized lightweight. Yusuke Kasuya should probably be a featherweight. Volkanovsky should probably be a bantamweight. Volkanovsky is 5'5 five, five with a 5'4 reach. Um, you know, we're talking Frankie Edgar size without the footwork. But um, he is a national champion wrestler in Australia. I realize that's not the most stunt, the most telling thing. It's, you know, it's no Czech national wrestling champion. <laughs> he's no Carlos Vimola. But honestly, he's a good technical wrestler. He reminds me a lot of Gregor Gillespie, who recently made his debut in the He's got a little power in his hands. He's a very willing power striker who's got a couple knockouts that way. But he only show, throws one big shot at a time, and as fights go on, his, his striking largely fades away. But he is an absolutely hell-bent wrestler. We'll just go after takedown after takedown, knows how to chain his wrestling, knows how to switch angles, switch approaches. And on the ground, he's a very good, uh, consistent grappler, you know, he, he can give up position because he's so small. He can get uh, overworked a little bit, but he's strong and he will not give up. He will not give up submissions. He will not let guys overwhelm him. He will scramble to all hell. And Kasuya is just kind of your prototypical Japanese fighter, almost to, or, well, very much to a fault. Tends when he's striking, doesn't have bad boxing, but really fights in these very short bursts and flurries. Throws with a lot of power, without a lot of connecting pieces. Just is willing to kind of lazily give away parts of a fight and let guys pick away at him. And then the only time his grappling comes into play, and he's a very good grappler, but the only time he tends to grapple is when he gets hurt or when he gets taken down already. Like, he has to be absolutely getting shit kicked to grapple. That might actually serve him all right here against Volkanovski. If Volkanovski charges out of the gate, cracks him hard, takes him down, and is working him over on the ground, that could bring out the aggression in Kasuya's ground game. But I just don't trust giving Volkanovski uh, a lot of position. If Kasuya is giving away aggression and position to Volkanovski, I think Volkanovski's going to be able to ride him out for a win. So I got Volkanovski here. No, I'm, I'm going to slightly disagree with you on this, and uh, I, I do think Kasuya, I mean, if you look at his record, he's got a bunch of submission wins, including an arm lock win that he's got over Damian Brown, who we discussed earlier. Yep. Now, the thing that I find uh, a bit of a problem is the fact that, yes, as you mentioned, it's when he sort of starts, you know, like in a video game, you know, take damage, take damage, and then you unleash your super attack, but... I think that Volkanovski, Volkanovski cracks him once or twice really, really well, and he's not getting back. He's not going to be able to use that grappling. Um, I, you know, his his striking is has much more polish. His ability to you know dodge and come back from, uh, you know, his his counterattack game is perhaps not as uh, as bad as you'd expect from someone who's mostly been a wrestler. And um, not only that, but he's he's they're both very scrappy grapplers, but you know it, it's. Yuska has more of a build to his game, whereas uh, whereas Bokanovsky is just more like right out the gate, grab the single leg, snag it from there, turn the corner, work another angle, and then eventually work you down from there. So I'm not really sure how that – really sure what avenues Kasuya has to win this. Um, so, I mean, again, this is a very random sport. You never know. He might uh, – he might – 
catch something at some point, but I really don't see how Volkanovski should not be favored to win this. The only way I see is if Volkanovski is – if he catches an arm bar on the ground, basically in transition, he gets Volkanovski scrambling and going after takedowns and is able to throw up an arm bar, and that would be – that. that's how, the only way I can see it happening, which yeah. I don't like betting on fire, fighters by Hail Mary submission. Yeah. That's- um. Volkanovski is the favorite, minus 160 to minus 175. Kasuya, the underdog, plus 153 to plus 130. I'm actually okay with those just because Kasuya is a solid submission finisher. Let's see. Kasuya by submission is plus 400. Maybe a tiny prop bet there. Just like... Maybe not, but the thing is, Volkanovski's record, even regionally, is really pretty decent. He's fought a lot of good guys. He's come up the right way, fighting good competition, and um, the odds could be wider, but for his UFC debut, I'm, I'm not sad to see them as small as they are, especially with his whole size thing. There were, you know, there were a couple of fight, uh, prob- or moments in his last fight in PXC, or his PXC title fight, that was really back and forth against, um, oh god, what's it? Yusuke Yachi? where Yachi's a lot bigger than... um, It was at 145, but Yachi's a lot bigger than Kasuya. And Yachi was able to get Volkanovski down a few times, get his back, like, just able to physically overwhelm him. But Volkanovski kept battling back through it and scrambling through it and eventually came out with the win. So I'm I'm willing to see the odds be a little close, but I'm, I'm glad to see Volkanovski the favorite there. That brings us to Kyle Noak versus Omari Akhmadov. And uh, I believe this is you, or is it me? That's probably you. Oh, know. it's probably – okay. It, it's, we'll, we'll call it me, whatever. I uh, This is an interesting fight because it's a battle of two strikers who really aren't – they aren't bad strikers – but they tend to only really have one pace and one, like they tend to only throw big single strikes or big power combinations, and they tend to only work at one rate, which means that they are both subject to getting pressured into funky losses. So for like Noke, in his last fight, in his last couple fights, you know, Alex Morono Morono stole a terrible decision, but an unsurprising one in that fight just by being totally unwilling to back off of Noak and just pressuring him the whole way through. Didn't land the best shots, maybe even got outworked at times, but was pressuring the whole way. They gave him a Diego Sanchez-esque decision just for forward pressure and work. And then Kaida Nakamura, uh, Noak landed some big shots early, but the thing with Nakamura is that he's just so insanely like, I will march forward through you no matter what you do and throw my awkward, funky punches at weird timing and weird angles no matter what, that even as Noak was landing, Nakamura was just able to continually march him down. And Akhmadov has the same problems. Like, Akhmadov... You know, we've seen consistently he just has this one note and one pace that even guys like Sergio Marias and Eliza Zaleski have been able to time him eventually and knock him out. Um, I'm going to take Noak in this one just because Noak is the cleaner striker. And he's cleaner and he's more diverse. Akhmadov just tends to, you back him up and he will sit down and throw the same two hooks over and over again. He's really predictable. No, you back him up and, you know, he throws straight punches, he throws uppercuts, he throws body kicks. The strikes he picks aren't predictable. It's just kind of the speed and timing with which he picks them is. And I think, you know, it'll be interesting to see which of these guys asserts the pressure game because both guys have problems being pressured. But I think that Noak is just a little more diverse, and he's going to come out of this on top. And he's also a little tougher. He's only been knocked out once by uh, Scott Smith, I believe it was, years ago. Yeah, but that's you know, <laughs> getting knocked out by that guy. I mean, yeah. Jesus. Yeah, and so, especially at that point in time. Yeah, I, I think that I, I'm picking him to just have the edge of diversity and toughness and um, – 
you know, in a battle of two guys who are going to kind of fight a similar, a very similar fight, I think. Yeah, you know, I'm going to have to agree with you on this, that Kyle Noak should certainly be the guy to take this. And not only because of the fact that he is a cleaner striker, but his striking defense seems better. Uh, and also the fact that he's able to take a shot a lot better, whereas you know, Akhmadov, we saw him in that loss against Sergio Moraes, where I think that was his probably his only finish by strikes that we've seen standing to this day. I'm, I'm not, you know, it, it's just... I, I just don't – I can't trust Akhmadov. I can't do it. I, no matter what, you know, his, his wins that he's had in the UFC have been – you know, they've been strange affairs, I guess. But it's like you said, he's, he's just going to pick from the same bag. He's just going to go for the same two or three setups, and that's it. And basically, it's the same setup for the same two or three sets of strikes, the same combinations. Um, other than that, it's essentially just, you know, trying to play a counter game but not being particularly that great at that counter game, whereas Noak has more tools in his box to be able to finish a fight. And especially if it means, you know, when it comes to working on the ground, you know, he trains with far better guys. He has shown a more consistent work rate, and his cardio is actually pretty damn good, which I can't say the same thing about. So Kyle Noak is uh, certainly my pick on this one. Kyle Noak, I-, I will say his cardio is not bad. But he's one of those dudes that when the fight gets late, he looks more exaggeratedly tired than almost any other fighter. Like, he gets, like, the sweat dripping down his hair. Like, he's got just the right kind of hair that his hair just becomes this, like, wet mop that's, like, water running everywhere. Like, it looks like somebody's just, like, out there, like, spraying him with a hose at all times. Yeah, like, he just got chased by a lion. Yeah. That, Noke always has that look to him when fights start to get late. So he's not a bad fighter late. It's just he, he looks ridiculously tired. Uh, that brings up uh, the odds on that fight. Noke is actually the underdog here, plus 155 to plus 135 or 130. Akhmadov, the favorite, minus 167 to minus 189. I don't. See right. that? I actually think that that's a pretty good opportunity yeah. for a small bet on Noak as an underdog. He like Akhmadov has never shown any of the kinds of things that have me picking him against any veteran fighter. I'm sorry. Have the odds makers looked at their recent losses and who they were to? Like, what the hell? I don't. Yeah, yeah it's whatever. It's, it's whatever. interesting. I'm I'm not seeing that with this fight. I I mean. I, yeah. You know, they both hit with some power. They both, like I say, they have very similar styles of games, very similar approaches to how they fight. But I just, yeah, I don't know. I, I'm surprised Akhmadov, I'm surprised to see Noke be an underdog here. Akhmadov has never really done anything to back himself up as being one of the, like, you know, part of the Dagestani knuckle, knuckle game cartel. So. Yeah. That brings us to the co-main event, Jake Matthews, Andrew Holbrook. Take it away. Yeah, uh, well, let's make this brief. I'm going to go with Jake Matthews on this one, and largely because of the fact that, yeah, he has had a bit of, uh, you know, he has a, bit of, uh, has a bit of a rough patch in some of his more recent fights. You know, he does have the loss to James Vick and to Kevin Lee. But that notwithstanding, he had a hell of a fight against Johnny Case, and he demonstrated so much growth. Uh, in that fight from his – after suffering that loss to James Vick, which was his first loss of his career, I don't really see Holbrook posing the same sort of challenges that would really get him in any sort of trouble there. Uh, it should be noted that Holbrook is 1-1 one and one right now in the UFC. He won his debut against Ramsey Nijem by decision, and he ended up getting uh, knocked out by Joaquim Silva. Uh, I he shouldn't have won, but, FR, you know, too. That, that – did you yeah, that, that was that was a bit of a spotty. Yeah, you, you're you're right about that too. That was a that was a very odd fight too. But uh, somehow he ended up getting the decision. And look, I mean, certainly people grow between one fight and the next, or at least you hope they would. But uh, I don't really see Holbrook being a guy who's made the improvements in his game from his last few fights to actually beat someone who's not only uh, got a hotter hand, but who's really showing a lot more progression in his career thus far. Uh, Matthews is striking as good. His submission game is pretty crafty. You know, sometimes he might have to skip a few steps, but he's really fun in these scrambles. And I, I don't, I don't know. I just don't think that Holbrook is the uh, kind of athlete that would be able to give him fits, nor is he as good a wrestler to keep him down and uh, punish him from there. So there's that. 
Yeah, that's that's kind of the thing here is that um, Holbrook it, Holbrook is a pretty good athlete. Like, he's a very powerful fighter, but he also he puts so much power into everything. I, I don't know that his cardio can maintain. Like he just is, you know, all of his limbs are like huge and muscled, and everything he throws with all his body is grappling is super aggressive and athletic, and it's not built for to like maintain control to maintain cardio at all. And then his striking is he's very, he's, he's a very willing, aggressive power striker with none of the tools or defensive ability to keep himself safe while he strikes. And that was a big reason I picked him to get knocked out really quick by Joaquim Silva in his last fight, which he did. And, um, it's going to be a problem for him against Matthews because Matthews isn't the best striker out there, but he's gotten a lot better. He looked great in that case fight, dealing with a very linear but diverse striker in Johnny Case. Um, now, Johnny Case doesn't have the power that Holbrook had or the maybe the athletic bursts that Holbrook has, but I also don't think Holbrook has the wrestling that Kevin Lee does that he was able to use to really... Uh, give to really surprise Matthews and otherwise Matthews grappling game is a been a long time standby for him it's always really solid and Holbrook for being a really power grappling specialist that being really where he cuts his teeth you know he didn't he he wasn't really able to overwhelm or threaten Ramsey Nijem on the ground when he had the fight there I don't think that his grappling is like, I think he's so aggressive that I don't necessarily know that he has the control to take guys over there at this level. So I got to pick Matthews here. And I think Matthews is probably largely going to be able to keep it, keep it standing and outstrike Holbrook and hurt him pretty bad on the feet just because Holbrook comes in so wild, so overextended on his punches. So odds here, this is uh, Matthews is the largest favorite on this card. Minus 300 to minus 455. Holbrook, the underdog, plus 365 down to plus 250. Um, I would still caution a little bit on being that heavy on the Jake Matthews hype train. Um, Matthews has, he has hit problems against really, uh, basically really aggressive powerful athletes that are willing to go after Matthews have beat him. Um, and even a very underwhelming athlete who was really aggressive almost beat him. Akbar Areola threw Matthews for a hell of a loop just by willing to be being willing to come after him and throw kicks and be an aggressive fighter. So Holbrook is much less technically sound than Kevin Lee as a wrestler and less tough than James Vick as a striker poses less of the problems that James Vick does as a fighter in general. But there is a chance like Holbrook is a big, powerful athlete who is going to be aggressive and pursue Jake Matthews and Jake Matthews, uh, has yet to really show consistently that he handles that kind of fight well. So I'm glad to see Matthew. I mean, I think Matthews is a deserved favorite here, but he's a bit of a wide favorite. And um, the only thing is, I don't think that Matt that Holbrook. Well, I mean, Holbrook has been submitted by Jake by James Vick. So maybe there's an off chance for a. Andrew Holbrook by submission prop bet. Let's see. I don't see Holbrook winning a decision. That's the thing. Holbrook inside the distance is plus 552. Holbrook by submission plus 800. If Holbrook's going to win, I would suggest, I would assume it would be by submission. He, that it would be that he catches Matthews getting sloppy like he did against James Vick. Um, but it's worth noting, worth, worth realizing it's there, and that Matthews has consistently been a little more hyped than he has been a good performer in the cage. 
Uh, and that brings us to Derek Brunson versus Robert Whitaker. And uh, I am picking. Let's see who. Who did Derek, Derek Brunson last? This is a thing. I, I got to make sure. How how much am I screwing this up? What are you looking for? I picked Uriah Hall last time. Mm. And that was a mistake. Yeah. And I got to think a lot about picking Robert Whitaker here. Because Brunson has this problem. He's wildly he – like, and he's a lot like Andrew Holbrook, frankly, but with a much better wrestling base in that he has a confidence in his striking and aggression to his striking that is almost entirely unwarranted, but that he makes incredibly functional. Like, he is a really ugly striker, but he's a good athlete, and he'll just fucking go for it. If he thinks he has an athletic edge over a dude in the cage, if he thinks that you're weaker than him, that you are... Going that you give that you respect him. If Derek Brunson thinks that you respect him in the cage, he will just go out and put it on you without any questions at all. He, you know, he will just charge at you, chin forward, both hands flying at the same time, and dare you to knock him out. And if you don't knock him out, he'll beat your ass. And that's kind of how he's been fighting lately. You know, that's why he's got a string of four knockouts to his name. This is a dude who was known as his nickname was the Blanket when he was in Strike Force. He was Derek the Br- the Blanket Brunson, and now he's fighting like he doesn't give a fuck. So, got to respect that. And the thing is, so you basically you got to ask: Is this the point where Derek Brunson finally pays for fighting like that, or is this the point where Robert Whitaker pays for being a tiny middleweight? Because he is, you know, he's a he. Well, he's not even that tall. He's six foot, but he was a guy that was legit at welterweight. He was cut into welterweight and was fine there. I don't even know that Whitaker. I don't even know that I trust that Whitaker's six foot. But he's a, you know, he's a stocky six foot, a short armed six foot, and I don't know. I don't even actually know that he's that short arm. Maybe that's wrong. He's his lo- arms are longer than he is tall. Yeah, so. he seems he seems decently enough proportion for. I don't know. I, it's but it's weird. Like the the question to me is is Robert is, is which of these guys pays for fighting in a way that they is maybe not conducive to their division to their success. Like what you know, Whitaker. Is he is he going to be too small to fo- to face aggressive, powerful athletes at the top of 185? Because the guys he's been beaten lately, Robert Whitaker, um, a lot of them are dudes who will sit back and wait and watch and see what he does. Yeah, that's very especially in the case of Uriah Hall and Brad Tavares. So that's yep. just and yeah. I don't and you know Brunson won't. Brunson will just go after him and push him and throw him around and see if he can. I, you know what? I'm going to pick Derek Brunson here. I'm going to say that Derek Brunson's overwhelming aggression is going to carry him through another fight and is going to carry him all the way to the top of the division. So I don't know that he can win a title doing it, but I think he can keep winning fights doing it. So I, I got to go with that here to get another uh, another win that on paper, I do not, I would not pick Derek Brunson to win this fight. But I think that, um, Whitaker sits back and is willing to give too much space and too much time. And Brunson's just going to go out and say, I'm bigger than this guy. I'm stronger than this guy and I can run him over. And it's going to be one of those Conor McGregor-esque manifest destiny, the secret kind of things where because you believe it, suddenly it's true. And we're going to he- you know, have to hear more people spout that kind of nonsense. Maybe. Um Here's my thing with this. Now, I certainly do agree with you as far as the outcome. I do think that Derek Brunson should be able to win this fight. Uh, the thing is, with Robert Whitaker, as any real sane, smart uh, striker would do, you know, he's he's more than content to 
start off the feeling out period, gauge his distance, be able to establish what his range is going to be, and that of his opponent as well. Try to see where your feints get you and what kind of reactions you can bait from the opponent. And that sort of thing is maybe something he may not have as much time for because Brunson is not exactly afraid to just rush in and do what he's got to do. Now, he had four fights in strike force that I've noticed that I've been able to note here. One of them was um, – a loss, two of them were uh, decision wins, and one of them was a submission. I'm not sure why they necessarily called him the blanket. Maybe those fights were just that interminably, you know, just just that one note and boring that it warranted that. But he did have a handful of finishes in the Carolinas well before he got into uh, strike force. I think, he had I, I think it was fight. partially a self-imposed nickname, too, that he wanted to be known for smothering people and, like, shutting them down. Well, shit, that's a crafty tactic because he's been just – he's been wrecking motherfuckers as of yeah. late. I mean, when, when you look at the fact that it's not just his, his recent wins. As you mentioned, he's got a five-fight win streak, and four of those have been finishes, four straight finishes. You look at how he's doing it and against who. Ed Herman, who, okay, he's definitely not in his prime. Sam Elvey, who can take a hit. Rowan Carnero and Uriah Hall. And it's just the way he's doing it. It might not sound like much when you look at the names, but the way that these fights end up looking and, and the manner in which he's able to explode from one second to the next, fake you out with a shot, and then go up top and crack you in the face, it, it just doesn't seem to me like, you know, Whitaker has been taking on a bunch of guys that have been mostly known for their striking, and he's done well. He's done very well for himself. And it's it's... It's good to see how he did after the Stephen Thompson loss and how he's picked things up after that. Um, I just don't really see how this kind of – this particular brand of wrestler, this kind of Yoel Romero, uh, super explosive type um, of athlete, I, I don't know how he's going to do against that. So that's going to be that's gonna be something that, that's new for everyone, including Whitaker. I don't see him faring very well against that. I mean, stuffing shots, probably out of the question. You know, what's he going to do in around maybe round two or three when he's got to carry that weight uh, against the cage? You know, what, how, does he, how does he handle that from, you know, round three to five? I don't know, man. And that's even if it gets there. If he doesn't get caught with something funky or if he doesn't end up on his back just eating those, those fists, it's just going to be – it's going to be a mess after that. So, while I do think that he certainly – I'm not going to question uh, Whitaker's heart or tenacity in any way – I just don't know if physically this is one of those things that he's going to be able to handle when Brunson really turns that switch on. The thing I will say in Whitaker's defense is his takedown defense in the UFC has been phenomenal. Phenomenal. He has been a great, yes. great uh, stuffer of takedowns. Yes. He has also maybe not sh- faced a athletic wrestler of Derek Brunson's caliber. His, the, probably the best wrestler he's fought to date, b- or the best wrestlers he's fought to date are like, Colton Smith and Court McGee and both and, of them yeah. aren't bad wrestlers technically, but they're not exceptionally powerful athletes. No. Um, otherwise, largely his career has been made up of fighting strikers. Um, but I would also say to Derek Brunson or to, also in, you know, the big avenue for victory here for uh, Robert Whitaker is, like I say, Brunton will throw his – he will lead with his face out over his feet with both hands thrown at the same time with zero recognition for defending himself. And if Whitaker can time that coming in and hit him with a hook or an uppercut, you know, that that's, that's his avenue to win. Uh, it's just also for Brunson, he's been pretty damn tough. Like, Yoel Romero had to hit him so goddamn much to finish him in that fight. And nailed him over and over until knocking him out in the third round. That was like body elbows that he finally knocked him out with. It wasn't even the multiple uppercuts and hooks he landed to Brunson's jaw. So, Brunson's tough and... Um, it'll be an interesting fight. It'll be an interesting fight because it's a good, it'll be good to see, you know, which of these guys who they're both elite middleweights with very particularly tuned games. And it'll be interesting to see which one of them keeps going and keeps that momentum going forward. On that note, Derek Brunson is the favorite. I'm actually a little surprised on that. Minus 129 to minus 150. Robert Whitaker, the underdog, plus 120 to plus 110. 
I do not – I don't know. I mean, if you have as much belief in Brunson as maybe we've expressed, you could bet on him as a slight underdog. He's a fairly narrow underdog here. But I honestly – both these guys are good, and they both have strengths exactly where the other guy has limitations. So mm-hmm. it's not a fight that I would feel necessarily all that super confident in. On that note, I think we're going to close the show. I, I don't gamble that much. So I don't have any other particular – I've given small tips, so I'm not going to try and expound and push those because I'm just talking about what I see in the odds. I – um. And I think we need to get this thing done and out the door. So thank you for joining me, Vic. You can find me on Twitter at these anytime. You can find Vic on Twitter at Vic M. Rodriguez. You can find both of us over at bloodyelbow.com. If you're watching this on YouTube, which you should be, give us a like. That's a thumbs up. Subscribe to MMANation.com. That's D-O-T-C-O-M. That's our YouTube channel. That helps us a ton. Thanks, everyone, for tuning in, and we will see you next time.